Hi everyone, today I am practicing Chopin Etude Opus 10, number 1. I started learning this months ago and really lives up to its reputation of being very difficult. I have thought a lot about how to learn it efficiently and the technique involved in playing this etude well. I will share some of my ideas with you in this video. So let me talk first about how to learn this etude. I think students tend to approach a piece exactly the same way. We listen to it, we like it, and we jump into learning the notes from the beginning to the end. It is my opinion that we should all think about how the piece was written and consider its structure before jumping into it. It's like navigating from one place to another. If you have an understanding of the general direction you're headed, so like north, south, and which big highways you want to take, it's much easier than relying on every turn and every street names that uh, Google Maps is commanding you. In other words, you are more in control. Once you have the big picture in mind, you can further divide the larger sections into manageable chunks. This will help you make sense of the harmonies and phrases. My recommendation in learning this etude is to memorize it as soon as possible. And the reason is because this etude is one of those etudes. You can't really look at the music and your hands at the same time. So the faster you memorize it, you can really focus on your hands and make sure you're playing the right notes because playing the right notes itself is hard. So with the structure and phrases as your roadmap, you begin learning the notes. Now, our brains are totally capable of reading notes on the page, playing the notes, and thinking about what to eat for dinner. But no, the best way to memorize it is to involve all your senses, your oral, visual, and physical sensations. And make sure you're connecting your oral senses with your physical senses and visual senses. When you're letting all of your receiving inputs make connections in your brain, that's when the learning is the most effective and you're not wasting any time. Try not to go back and practice those hard spots that feel awkward to you again and again until you're able to play the piece at a certain tempo. It doesn't need to be fast, but just one tempo from the beginning to the end. Your priority is to be able to play it from the beginning to the end at a moderate tempo and mistakes are totally okay at this stage. So that's the overall plan for learning this etude. And now I'll talk about the technique. Let's think about what is being studied in this etude. The pattern is the same throughout the etude. You go up in some form of arpeggio and come down in some form of arpeggio. The arpeggios must be executed in a swift motion and they are continuous. You're going up or down in a pattern of 10th or 11th and it is usually a stretch for most people. Here's the first technical thing to think about. Your hand gets strained when it stretches. When you stretch your hand out like this, it shortens the muscle in your forearm and you can feel the tension. You hear teachers talk about using the wrist. They may call it wrist rotation, and basically you're using your wrist to get your fingers make easier and better contact with the keys. But lots of students forget that the wrist is connected to your forearm, which is connected to your elbow, which is connected all the way to your shoulders. When you're moving across five or six different octaves, your elbow has to move horizontally to facilitate the movement of your fingers. Now, I don't want you to exaggerate anything and do the rotation just to show that you're doing the rotation. Every hand has its own suitable amount of rotation depending on the size and length of your fingers. When you're coming down, your wrist is down on the top notes and it comes up on the fourth notes of the group. If you intentionally do the accents, which Chopin wrote, it helps loosen up. I'll show you what it looks like without the rotation. Every note is equal and you're not using the wrist to make it easier for the shorter fingers to play. You're stiff in the forearm and you will not last very long like this. 
In a fast tempo, the movement is subtle. Too much movement will interfere with the speed, so just understand the mechanism, practice it, and you won't really have to think about it. And despite the wrist rotation, your arm will get fatigued. And the tension needs to be released as frequently as you can. Whenever you have a chance, and that is whenever you have a rest, even a 16th rest, that's when you consciously command your arm to relax. And because of the difficulty of the etude, students often forget to relax. Believe it or not, releasing the tension does not come automatically, and it also requires practice. So by doing this, you are letting minimal tension accumulate in your forearm. This is the next eight bars and I want to talk about legato. Chopin does write legato in the beginning of the piece, but it's impossible for most people to connect all the notes. Look at the distance between these two notes. That's a fifth between my two and four, and it's a quite a bit of stretch. So rather than straining my hands to do the impossible, I'm letting the notes go. Now, I know some of you weren't even thinking about the intervals here, but I think it helps to notice the wide intervals that you have to play so you can make the adjustments mentally and physically. And here's another large interval, a sixth between your two and one. I have a pretty long thumb, still a quite a reach from this position, but I didn't know it was that far for these two fingers until I actually tried it out. Now with this awareness, I make a mini leap from two to one and I miss less notes in this awkward bar. And I practice it like this play the close notes super fast and leap as quickly as I can. But don't play it. Leap, but don't play it. It makes you think about having to open and close your hand really fast. If you're still missing notes here, it may be because you're not thinking about the first note. Visualize the D sharp and hear the D sharp right before you play it. D sharp, D sharp, D sharp, D sharp. The others will follow, but the first note has to be in place for the others to follow. This one is a little easier, but you still want to be aware of the slightly de decreased distance between G sharp and B. And this page is where I have the most number of wrong notes. It's basically a minefield. I say this in my other videos too, but you really have to know why why you're having trouble to solve the problem. Here, the challenge is that we're working with black keys. The fingers are on a raised and narrow surface, so they are not as stable. It also includes a fifth, so your fourth and second fingers are in a precarious position. Three out of the four notes are black keys, which means my wrist stays up without much rotation. Also, my fingers are flatter. I feel safer that way because more surface meets the keys than playing with just fingertips. Some pianists might not agree with me on this, but this is what works with my fingers. This is 
another tricky spot and my fourth finger here keeps getting stuck between the two black keys. With this awareness, I try to let the fourth finger go as soon as it is done playing and my wrist initiates the movement to go from four to five to A to E flat. Oh, here's an actual trick. Have you considered taking some notes with your left hand? I do it here and in other some other places. I take the B flat with my left hand. It takes a small but significant burden off of my right hand. Here, your pinky needs to find the D, which is between two black keys. If you play inside, that's towards the board, your pinky might hit C sharp or D sharp. So I have my pinky play on the outside and just use my wrist to help my thumb play the B flat. So you get the idea by now. It's all arpeggios up and down many octaves, but the difficulty is much more specific than having to play really loud and really fast. Once you understand the mechanism of the wrist movement, horizontal elbow shift, and the quick opening and closing of your hand, then you have to think about the details, the wide intervals of black key and white key placements in order to adjust yourself physically. Too often, students have this blind faith that if they keep playing something over and over again, it will miraculously get better. That's the long way, and you may not even get to playing it satisfactorily this way. It's much more efficient to think about and analyze the problem. Some bars you missed the notes because you weren't even aware of the wider interval and other times it's a matter of a finger getting stuck between two black keys. In other words, each mistake you make may have its own reason that you must find out if you want to be solid in your performance. So in this video, I talked about the overall plan to learn the etude. Then I talked about the general mechanism, how to use your hand and your arm to play it. And I gave you some examples to overcome some specific difficulties. I would like to go on and on and expand on some ideas, but I think the video will be too long then. I promise I'll be back with another video soon. Until then, practice intelligently and I'll see you in the next video.